gold obviously has broken out to new highs. Silver has a long ways to go to get to highs, but it is you know moving above some significant resistance levels, like the most recent one being 30. I think your next stop on silver is probably 35, 36, pretty short term. Could move to 38 and just move right through that. And then ultimately, I have a call for silver of $60. Today, we have a very special guest. David Hunter is someone who I followed for the last three or four years. He's known for making bold predictions about the economy, about the market, about the silver and gold price. But in my opinion, there's some other words we can use to describe him. He's experienced, he has credentials, he has courage, and he has an accurate track record we're going to ask him where we might be one year from now with the markets, with gold and silver, with the precious metal mining stocks. David, welcome to Ron's Basement. Well, thank you, Ron. Thanks for having me on. Good to see you. Yeah, good, good to see you as well. And, and uh, David and I share uh, having gone to DePaul University in Chicago. So we'll put our put our minds together here. But we're really here to hear from you what are you seeing in the markets now, David? Anything that's top of mind about what's happening uh, that you'd like to share with us? Sure. Um, yeah, basically, I think obviously NVIDIA has been the big story of today or from last night on. Um, and what I see that is basically is it's cleared the way for this market to move higher. Um, it had paused for just a few days and waiting for that. And you had a lot of people calling for you know, time for a pullback because it's, you know, high expectations. How, how much more can it outdo expectations? Um, but again, NVIDIA proved that they are the king dog out there right now and just delivered and exceeded even the whispers and up it goes. So my my view is that we are in a melt-up, a uh, melt-up that's going to have stair steps as every market does. But I think the last stair step which ended, I think, in April, um, I think it was April 19th, it bottomed. Um, and we've been up like 6% this this month. Um, I think it's going higher without, you may not see another 5% pullback before the top. You could, I mean, there's nothing that says it has to do it this way, but um, you, know, you had a 10% pullback in October, 10% correction back in October. And then you had the 5% one in April, uh, I really think you're not going to see them exceed that probably. So so I think we're in that melt-up phase. Um, I think it's going to just get steeper and steeper as we move towards the top. I call this a top of a 42, what will be a 42-year circular bull market that started in August of 1982. Um, we've had several cyclical bulls and bears within that. But I think we're coming to the end of a secular bull market, a major one, that will end in a final blow off. Wow. So when you say a final blow off, any any targets like with the S and P five hundred or the Dow that you're looking at? Sure, I I had pretty high targets already, and in my January letter, I raised my targets to um, I had a six to seven thousand range for the S and P. I've just moved that to seven thousand. My convictions are that if anything, it's going to exceed my targets. So, uh, and I moved up on the Dow to 55,000 from 48. I moved up on the NASDAQ from 20,000 to 23,000. And on the Russell, I had a, a number that was way above the street, but, and people were pretty negative on the Russell, but I had a 3,000 target and I've raised that to 3,300. So, um, you know, again, I, I raised them a while back, but those are my current targets. Uh, and as I said, I wouldn't be surprised if they prove conservative. Yeah. And, and I know you have uh, another scenario that unfolds after we hit those targets. And we're going to talk about that. But how soon do you think these these high targets, these blow off tops could be could be hit? Yeah, it all it all really depends on do we get consolidations along the way or are we really going to see this thing just start building into a, a crescendo, into a parabolic if we really take off and, and we see a buying stampede here in the next month, you could be there by sometime this summer. If it, you know, if you have pauses along the way, like the, you know, even if there are a week long pause like we just had or the month long pause we had before that, 
it stretches it out and it could go into the fall. I'm pretty sure we're going to see the top before the election. I'm pretty sure we may see the top by Labor Day. Um, but again, I, I get myself in trouble because I, I just say maybes on these things. Yeah. And people write that down and say, you told me it was going to be there by you know this date. And it's not. Well, this is the end of a 42-year secular bull market. I'm not going to be able to precisely tell you you know, when it's going to end. I'm only telling you we're in the last stages. Yeah, you're, you're sharing with us based on your analysis, your experience, what you think could unfold. And um, I have a question for you as we as we look at these markets, like, and, and I think what you're what you're referring to is it seems to me like the market would be defying gravity. Is that is that because of uh, investor psychology? Is that because of underlying fundamentals or how, how does that all play out? Yeah, I'll, I'll point to a couple um, things. If you look back to the NASDAQ or the dot com bubble in 99, 2000, mm -hmm. you saw a similar shape where it built. And then, uh, you know, you, people were calling for a top in 98, I can remember. And by 99, it was, oh, yeah, we're topping. And then six months later, it's higher again by a lot. And then finally topped out first quarter of 2020 or of uh, 2000. Um, that's a way a, a, you know, a parabolic final move takes place. It, it just gets steeper as it goes. A lot of it is psychology. Um, whether people, and I'm talking about the pros, whether they admit it or not, a lot of what they call is based on momentum. Mm -hmm. You know, the same people that won't like a market at 4,000 love it at 5,000. So, right. <laughs> um, and, you know, did fundamentals change that much? Not really, but boy, they got, they sure like it now. And that's kind of where I think we're at in the market is, as you know, a lot of professionals fought this thing all the way up. It was a bear market rally from 3,500 all the way up to 4,600. And then it corrected pretty sharply and went again. It was only when we made new highs where you started hearing people say, well, I guess it is a bull market. And you know, I'm talking about you know professionals. And mm -hmm. I think here with the, what NVIDIA just did, you're going to see the what I say could be a buying stampede. Mm -hmm. As FOMO kicks in, as those that have been defensively postured, not necessarily out of the market, but defensively postured, start realizing this thing has legs and say, you know, we're lagging the market. We got to get on board and more aggressively. And if if so much of the street decides at one time and retail being momentum driven as well, decides they got to get more invested um, all of a sudden, you got a very concentrated period of time where everybody's on one side of the boat. Now, you know, back in 2022, which is one of the reasons I said there was a melt up that was going to follow, um, everybody was on one side of the boat, but they were on the bearish side. And it was pretty clear to me, I had through 50 years of doing this, I had rarely seen such a universal belief that things were not good and were going down. Everybody was just convicted that that was you know that was the way it was going to go and they fought that changing that belief for quite a while but they are now i think you're seeing what we always see which is psychology does kick into even the pros and they start saying hey you know we've broken out the new highs it, you know when i thought it was a double top it wasn't a double top it's continuing to go in this last stage here we you know we've we've got to get on board what i think you'll hear though that accompany that psychology is a belief that uh and not necessarily right here because the fed's kind of still fighting it but i think we'll get numbers here as we go through the the next few months that say inflation slowing down the economy slowing down and that they will get back on board to rate cuts and end the fed tightening um and that's obviously not the belief of today the fed members are out there talking about more, you know, the, even though it's a, not a high probability, the probability of cuts are there. I mean, of hikes are there. So, but I think that'll change here in the next month. And, um, you know, the street's going to get on board to the idea that Fed tightening's over um, and that there's a whole cycle ahead of us. I don't believe that, but that's what I think will be the narrative. 
It won't. So, so you talked about everybody being on one side of the boat and, and it feels like a lot of times that's a good time to run to the other side of the boat where nobody is. I think a lot of our audience right now uh, with my channel are, are very interested in silver, gold, and the precious metal mining stocks. As you, as you think about this melt up phase that we're heading into any commentary on what you see going on with the, the those prices? Yeah, very definitely so. I I got beat up pretty bad for a while because I was uh, I remained bullish through uh, a pretty rough time in the metals. Basically, it looked to me back in the spring of 2022 as if they were going to break out, and um, and then the dollar went the other way in a big way. I mean, we had a big climb in the dollar over the next six months, and the metals went south. Uh, and so it wasn't until basically fall of 2022 that we finally bottomed in metal September fall in the miners, but um, September, October or somewhere in there. Um, and we've been kind of battling our way back uh, since then. They really started to pick up speed fourth quarter last year and into this year and have now really established themselves in a new bull market. And gold, obviously, has broken out to new highs. The silver has a long ways to go to get to highs, but it is, you know, moving above some significant resistance levels, like the most recent one being 30. I think your next stop on silver is probably 35, 36, pretty short term. Could move to 38 and just move right through that. And then ultimately I have a call for silver of $60. And I've said of late, it's 60, but if we get through 60, we could see 75 very quickly. Um, and on gold, which is, you know, 23, 50, 400, um, I think 3000 pre bust. Now we'll talk about what pre bust means later, but, um, and basically this year, I think you could see 3000 on gold. And I think that number is going to probably be conservative. Um, so they're both definitely in gear right now in, in a bullish mode with a lot of upside ahead and even more upside ahead for the miners that uh, you know move up when they move when the when the mining stocks eventually catch up with the with the increase in the price of gold and silver yeah it's so, taking them a while <laughs> yeah yeah they're they're lagging a little bit i was talking to uh, dan wilton the ceo of uh, first mining gold yesterday and he has a chart that shows the gold price and how the mining the gdx the gdxj and in particular the junior mining stocks have really lagged behind the gold price and and we, I pointed out to him, I said, isn't that supposed to be the inverse? Aren't, you know, the miners supposed to have leverage to the gold price and the junior miners even more? So we could be in for some some big moves in the uh, in the mining stocks. Yeah, I very much think so. I have pretty aggressive targets for all of them. And they're long, I mean, I've long held targets, but <clears throat> I think they're going to be realized this year. I see GDX going up to 65, um, GDXJ to 100. Um, uh, SIL to 75 and SILJ to 35. So there's wow. some big moves there. And again, I wouldn't be surprised if I end up being conservative on those. Wow. And, and you're saying that could potentially happen this year? Yes. Potentially I think, happen. I think if you look to 2016 or the period after the pandemic in 2020, mm -hmm. you know, 2020, we had that huge move between end of March and August. And I, th I see something similar to that again here, except bigger. Wow. Well, you, you, you've officially become very popular in Ron's basement with those predictions. So <laughs> <laughs> we're going to fly you here on a private jet if, uh, when, when, when those numbers hit. Um, quick question for you. Today is uh, the 23rd of May, 2024. Uh, both today and yesterday have been down days in the gold market and silver market. And, and the, the person joining us right now, the viewer, um, most certainly follows the gold and silver price very closely. I like to say that, you know, nothing goes up in a straight line. There will be pullbacks um, with the gold price and the silver price. Any any uh, words of encouragement or commentary in that regard? Sure. If, if people follow me on Twitter, they would have seen me today saying to uh, a couple people, turn your screens off, um, basically, <laughs> go find something productive to do. So right. um, my my belief is um, people are way too short term in this stuff. 
And what they have to realize, I, I mean, I, I tell them at the bare minimum, look at weeklies because, yeah. you know, the action in the last two days feels very bearish mm-hmm. until you look at it on a weekly and you realize, you know, it's higher highs, higher lows. It's not, yeah. it's nothing more than that. And um, the market has to keep cleansing itself and you know if if it burns itself out it's not going higher so yeah. these these stair steps are a process of building that wall of worry that allows it to continue and we've got a long run to go so it needs that big wall of worry um and obviously from a fundamental standpoint people will get nervous uh maybe maybe some of the sell-off is because they think that you know, if equities go up, they have to go down. The metals yeah. miners have to go down, but that's not the case. I mean, I think we are we we suffer from recency bias an awful lot of the time. So when I hear people out on CNBC or elsewhere telling you that, you know, typically the metals go counter counter to the equity markets, I go go back and look at two thousand one to two thousand eleven. You had a pretty good bull market, if I remember, in equities. And it was one of the biggest markets in in metals that we ever had. So, you know, they don't always move opposite to each other. And I don't think they're going to move opposite during this next few months. Right, right. And I think even with the gold here over the last three or four months, um, the dollar remained relatively strong, right? And and gold performed very well. So uh, yep. the, these, these uh, kind of common beliefs that are prevalent at times uh, aren't always accurate, I guess we could say. Yeah, the market loves to kind of throw you curveballs. If if you think there's <laughs> if you think it's a dogmatic market out there and that there's a formula, uh, you're going to be taught very quickly yeah. that markets will do the opposite of what you expect many times. So yeah. I have a I have a huge, um, or not a huge, but I have a pretty bearish view on the dollar. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm looking for the uh, DXY to fall to eighty, and you know would have thought by now we would have had that as part of the you know, the play in the metals, but the metals have moved without it. So I right. think it's easy for me to see my, the rest of my move and the metals come if I'm right about the dollar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so. right. Yeah. We'll be, we'll, we'll, we'll subscribe to the, uh, the dollar theory in relation to gold, uh, especially if the dollar drops now and gold continues to, to skyrocket. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> then, then it's time to say, yeah, that's a good theory. Yeah, <laughs> that works. We're, we're going to, we're going to stick with that one. So, so Bluff, Blow off top, big moves potentially here uh, in the coming months, quarters. But then there's another side to this story, right? Um, what what happens after we after we have this quote unquote good times? Yeah, I've had this view for quite some time that we were in the late stages of, and it's it's stretched. Obviously, the pandemic yeah. stretched it because I had this view even prior to the pandemic. But that we would have this blow off move in the market in the you know so called melt up in the market into a, t- a top that would probably stand for decades not a decade but perhaps a couple decades or more um so this you know the equity market top the highs of that top will likely be there for quite some time we can have bull markets cyclical bull markets within that um but probably not get back to these highs of this year um but following that, and the reason why I think it's going to be hard to get back to those highs, part of it is that I think we are headed for a global bust. I define a bust as um, something that feels like and looks to some extent like a um, depression, but happens in the time frame of a recession. Um, so, you know, very much like 2008, nine, except on steroids, meaning bigger than that. And much of what makes it a bust is the financial crack up, is the financial crisis that accompanies the recession. So yeah. it's not it's not so much that the economy is going to be worse than you know we've seen post World War II in a couple instances. It's really that financial crisis that I think is going to be maybe 2008 nine on steroids, and that was obviously the biggest in history. Mm-hmm. So this could be pretty bad. And the reason I think we are headed there is because we have leveraged like we've never had in the world before. So you have 320 yeah. trillion in in debt, global debt, and you've got quadrillions in notional value of derivatives. I mean, how do we wrap our head around these numbers? And derivatives are what I call the leverage on the markets. You know, debt is the leverage on the system, on the economy, and derivatives are leverage on the markets. 
And what we know from business school is that leverage works both ways. On the way up, it can enhance returns. And on the way down, it can really exacerbate the downside. And that's what I think we're going to have as an exager exacerbation of the downside. And probably in 2025, I think the you know it's a recession that then because of leverage turns into something worse. Um, we have, fortunately, in this country, we got hit hard in 2008. So our banks were forced to deleverage and become more capitalized. Uh, so I think our banks are less vulnerable. That doesn't mean they're not vulnerable, but less mm -hmm. vulnerable than, say, the European banks and the Asian banks and the Canadian banks who seemingly didn't watch us from 2008-9. They were in great shape in 2008-9, and now they are us. Um, so and Australia, too, is one that's vulnerable. So, so I think it'll be global. And, of course, you know, counterparty risk and, uh, you know, the closeness of the financial system around the world, the ties that are there means we are just as vulnerable, you know, we'll be pretty vulnerable too. So too, too big, too big of a situation for Jerome Powell and the federal reserve to come writing. I mean, I'm sure they will be taking action, but at some point do, uh, do the laws of mathematics take over and it's just too big of a problem for the fed to be able to spray some money on. Or... Yeah. Great question. I, I, I have a lot of people that will push back and say, they'll never let that happen. Yeah. And I go, that's not the issue. The issue is that they will react. I, I can predict probably it's easier to predict this than the markets that they will react. Right. The, the question is the timing of when they react. And, you know, what we have is a, a Fed that typically fights the last war and basically lots of organizations fight the last war. So, so what have we heard Paul say? He said, we're not going to go back there again. We we are dead set against blowing the system, you know, pumping the system up again. Mm -hmm. So they printed $5 trillion in 2000, in 2020. Um, you know, uh, people forget, we had a balance, Fed balance sheet in October 20, of October of um, 2008 of $875 billion. And then after the pandemic, it grew to $9 trillion. I mean, again, these numbers, how do you wrap your head around them? Um, but so he's got religion. He said, yeah, we know, you know, he's certainly been beat up and the Fed's been beat up for years about what they did. And um, I could argue both sides of that one. But um, but he's basically got religion now and said, I, I hear you and we understand we can't keep doing that. So we're going to try to bring the balance sheet back into a more normalized place. It's not going to happen overnight. We've been working on it the last couple of years. Um, but when when trouble hits, they're going to be slow to react because his whole mindset now is we're not going to repeat the mistakes of the past. Well, what they don't realize is they're not going to have a choice. Yeah. If you have a leverage system like we have, and again, it's not just the U.S., it's worldwide. And banks start domino failed bank failures start dominoing dominoing across the world. You're not going to be able to sit there and say, "Well, theory says we should not blow it up again. We should not pump it up again. So we're going to just let this happen." We'll all be living in caves. I mean, they can't do it, and human nature is they won't do it. So it's the easiest prediction I can have is that they will react. The problem is they're going to be slow, even slower than normal to react because of that mindset that, and, and guess who's cheering them on? The people telling them right on, in fact, criticizing them for not, not being aggressive enough in tightening are, is Wall Street. Wall Street says, yeah, we don't want you to pump it up again. You know, we don't want you doing this. So, you know, Paul says, yeah, you're right. I'm not gonna do that again. Um, and that'll, that'll last until all of a sudden, and, and then it's a question of right sizing. You know, you if if you got the kind of situation I think he's going to be facing, having having said we're not going to go back and just print five trillion, you know, maybe we can print a couple trillion, but we're going to be careful this time. <laughs> and then two trillion doesn't do anything and it keeps sinking. Yeah, maybe we need to do another couple trillion. Nothing happened. You know, it'll take them a while to get to right size policy that actually stabilizes things. And again. I, you know, I focus on Powell and the Fed, but it's Lagarde, it's you know Bank of Canada, it's uh, it's uh, Bank of Japan, it's everybody yeah. will be facing the same thing. It's going to be a global implosion. So, 
so so is the end result of all this as you're speaking and and i'm learning a lot from listening to you but i keep getting this feeling like the end result of all of this as we go through this bus phase um could be the uh the loss of value in a lot of these fiat currencies of the dollar the euro uh in real terms not necessarily you know compared to each other like on the dxy but in real terms is is that one of the end results and, and of course i'm thinking that because i'm a a, a gold and silver enthusiast and and, that, and look at that as more real value but but the, is there any way out of this predicament that we face where these fiat currencies don't lose value yeah i'm, I'm going to take this it's going to take a little bit to get there to answer your question but i'll start with saying that's i'm not sure my i'm not sure my question even made sense so uh, no it did uh, okay it, you certainly hear it from the austrians you know the austrians the austrian school basically thinks you know central banks are evil and and mm -hmm. what they've done is very bad. I mean, I'm not saying they're all wrong, but but they tend to think we're at that point where, you know, the Peter Schiff's of the world, where right. things are all going to blow up here. And, you know, you're going to have to go back on a gold standard. You're going to, you know, first the system is going to fall apart, but you're going to have to. I think he's about a decade too soon or certainly seven or eight years too soon. He, he I should say, they, the, that school of thought. Um, I think we'll get there. I think what your question implies, we will get there. Um, what I think happens precisely in the bust is I think we'll see one last flight to safety move in the dollar. You know, whenever crisis hits, we tend to get bid up. So I think the dollar could go from my 80 target, if I'm right, and it gets to 80, um, you know, in the next nine months or whatever, less than that maybe. Um, I think it, during the bust, it could go from 80 back to 120 or higher mm -hmm. uh, as people just run there saying, I don't know where else to go. Um, so you have one last hurrah on the dollar. And then I think the rest of the decade is spent on the downside. So you could see the dollar below 50 at some point by the end of the decade. Part of that on the dollar, I'll focus on the dollar first, but part of that on the dollar is that I believe the Fed balance sheet's going to grow to 30 trillion or higher during mm -hmm. the bust. So as I said, it starts slow, but ultimately to save the system is going to take a lot and mm -hmm. they'll overdo it because it, there's leads and lags. So yeah. I think whereas we pumped up five trillion, uh, you know, increase the balance sheet by five trillion in, in 2020, I think this time it goes from, you know, eight or nine trillion to 30 trillion. So 20 plus and proportionally, you see every central bank doing the same thing that doesn't you know, initially, I think the bus creates deflation temporarily for, mm -hmm. you know, probably less than a year. But um, but and so in deflation, that's why they are allowed. Uh, they have the ability to print that much is because in deflation, you almost have infinite ability to print. Right. Because of the lag to when that will become inflationary. Mm -hmm. I think the lags typically 18 months. It could be more or less than that. But that means by the second half of this decade sometime, we're starting, you know, we're starting, we're coming out of a hole. So we're coming out of negative inflation. But by 26, you're probably mid singles to high singles. By 27, you're probably double digit inflation. By by 29 or 30, you're probably 25% inflation. So so you create hyperinflation, but the lag doesn't, you can't predict that at least the Fed's not gonna be focused on that when they're trying to save the system. Um, but that's what we're headed for. And in that kind of environment, yeah, fiat cons and currencies are going straight down. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure about because obviously when you talk about the dollar, it's the dollar versus others. So versus the dollar, uh, other fiats may be going up, you know, versus the dollar, we're going to be hit the hardest cut probably because we're the one pump the most, um, right. et cetera. But, but I think all fiats are in trouble. You can take this scenario and, and obviously interest rates track inflation. Mm -hmm. If I'm talking about 25% inflation by the end of the decade, I'm talking about 15 or 20% interest rates by the end of the decade. What, uh, you know, that monetization, that 20 trillion in, in new money is monetizing debt. So we'll get an equal, something close to an equal amount in new debt, expanding mm -hmm. our debt by another 20 trillion, a government, you know, US treasury debt. Um, 
And so we're going to be looking at, you know, massive debt that has to be serviced. We can't service it at 5%. How the hell are we going to service it at 15 or 20%? So ultimately, I think it comes to a 2030s, and I don't say 2030, but sometime in the 2030s, probably first half of the 2030s, we we reach a point where the government's bankrupt. There's, you know, nobody wants our debt. Nobody wants anybody else's debt because the rest of the world is doing the same thing. And basically, you can't service your debt. You the Ponzi scheme comes to an end, and we collapse. I mean, that's to me, that's the end game here. Uh, as I say, I don't endorse what I'm saying is going to be the response to the to the bust. I'm just telling you what I think is the almost inevitable of events that are coming. Yeah. Um, so it's not a pretty picture ultimately, um, but what I think comes out of what people should take out of that is that get your house in order this decade because what comes after that is pretty god awful. And those that have any chance of surviving are those that are going to be probably free of debt and have built their wealth. And there is going to be a huge commodity cycle. You know, stock indexes will not get back to their highs or anywhere close to them. I think that after the bust, mm -hmm. commodities are going to go through the roof. I mean, gold can go to twenty thousand, yeah. silver can go to five hundred, um, you know, copper through the roof, oil can go to five hundred. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, there's there's opportunities in areas of the market, uh, just not S and P indexes. So, so we have the we have the boom. Uh, we have the bust. During the bust, uh, I would imagine we'll see gold and silver prices pull back from the boom levels. Let's say we get to that three thousand dollar gold, sixty dollar silver during this uh, potential near term, near term ish. We're not setting specific dates on anything. Boom cycle. We have the bust where gold and silver probably go down a bit, but in the long run, as these fiat currencies erode. Uh, real assets will be the place to be, commodities, silver, gold, other things like that. Like, and, and those tied to those assets. So the, the yeah. miners will do well, yeah. you know, oil companies will do well, oil stocks. Um, it's, but what, what won't do well are utilities, bonds, mm -hmm. um, probably a lot of growth stocks. You know, some will have growth that can outdo the, you know, the higher interest rate effect, but but a lot of them aren't, as, as we, you know, what I've learned over 50 years of doing this and, and managing money through many cycles, every cycle has different leadership. So this cycle was obviously tech and healthcare um, and growth stocks. The next cycle is going to be very much the commodity sector and, and industrials. You know, you'll, you'll see steel do well. You'll see, um, you know, the reshoring will mean lots of machinery and things like that will do well. Yeah. You know, about 10 years ago, I read uh, a, a saying that stuck with me, which I think applies to the scenario that you laid out. And the saying was, mathematics show no forgiveness on the altar of truth. Like you can only manipulate the system for so long. And, and I want to ask you kind of a, a higher level, broader question as you talk about how this bus plays out, how you know, the Fed will be forced to, uh, to, to kind of keep the system alive and that, and that essentially they'll be getting a lot of pressure and a lot of, a lot of factors being pushed on them to, to keep things going. And it, do you think that's because the, the powers that be are, they're beholden to the system, right? They'll do anything they can to keep it alive for as long as they can, because, you know, because, because if not, then we have this, when the reset eventually is forced upon us um they have more to lose than 99 percent of the other people yeah there's probably a little bit of that i actually think it's it's more more basic than that which is people just don't want it to happen on their watch you know i'm yeah. i'm let's say you're a policymaker you know if it's going to blow up i don't want to be the one responsible for it so right. you know i think it's everybody wants to attribute everything to and i, I can be um, as much about the new world order and where right. a lot of things are happening too. I mean, I think both are happening simultaneously. Some of this is just human nature and, and cycles. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I believe we're in a, to take it to a, a next step from the secular bull market cycle. I think we're in a super cycle 
which I define as the period between two depressions, the 1930s being the last depression, the 2030s being the next depression. Um, and so when you get to that last decade of a, of a super cycle, the, you know, every cycle you ratchet up. So it takes more money to bail you out of the last downturn and that creates bigger excesses. So the next, the next upturn is bigger, you know, or more excesses. And then that, you know, when it crashes, there's more imbalances. So it takes more to bail you out of that. So each successive recession and recovery has required more uh, of what's got us here, you know, yeah. more money, more borrowing, more, mm -hmm. you know, um, Keynesian economics, more monetary economic, you know, all of that. Um, and now you're at the point where, you know, it's like it's like something, uh, you know, wave theory, I guess, where the waves get successively bigger. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think we're at that point where or, it just goes kaboom. <laughs> kaboom. Or, or like fighting an infection with antibiotics and it, the anti antibiotics work the first time, the second time it might take a bigger dose, the next time it takes, and eventually, yep. yeah, eventually it just doesn't work anymore. So uh, we are not doom and gloomers, right? I, 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 I want to reiterate that. However, um, one of my previous guests said, I'm not a doom and gloomer. I get paid to assess risk, right? I get paid to look at, at what is actually going on out there. And you mentioned something earlier, which is a, a fascinating concept to me, this idea of normalcy bias, or I think I've also heard it been called, has been called recency bias. Like as humans, yeah. yep. as humans, we just think, well, uh, you know, like I'm 54 years old and I was raised in a typical middle-class family and the bank was always a safe place to keep the money, right? P put your money in the bank. And, and you know what, through my 54 years, the bank has always been a safe place to keep my money. So I think, and I think as recency bias or it would, would dictate then that the bank will always be a safe place to keep my money. And, and I think it's important again, not to be a doomer gloomer, but to be realistic that right like these things don't last forever and if all the evidence is pointing toward uh the fact that that we could be in for some difficult times well then we may want to assess the risk that we that we face and, and not just specifically for my money i have up the street at the bank but just in general about yep. what's about what's happening out there yeah yep. i will say i believe um because of the the printing press Mm -hmm. the the reason we can have a collapse in the 2030s and why i differ from the austrians who think the collapse is much nearer right is the printing press if yeah. you have and the printing press in my view on inflation if you have what i have what i've said is the work the risk right now is deflation not inflation everybody's worried about inflation right now i think the fed is likely has likely already gone too far on the tight side mm -hmm. and because of a lot of things that happened during the pandemic it's being kind of pushed out and masqueraded a little bit or yeah. disguised a little bit. So they don't realize the risks that are happening or the decay that's happening under the surface because they're too tight, mm -hmm. um, you know? And so it's gonna be, you know, it's one of those things where um, it looks like it's not gonna happen and it happens all at once. Oh, and okay. so I think we're gonna see deflation because of deflation, you can almost print money to infinity because there's a year or more before it's going to show up as inflation. So, so I have no problem saying twenty trillion dollars, even though it sounds like how would that ever be able to be happen without inflation? Well, there will be, but it doesn't look like it at the time. Um, so, because they're not, they're going to have the ability to pump it up one more time. Mm -hmm. um, I believe there is going to be as much money as needed to bail out pension funds to fund FDIC to whatever li liability needs there are. So in other words, as long as you have your money in an FDIC insured account under the $250,000 threshold, this cycle, I think you're safe. Yeah. Next cycle, meaning the 2030s, <laughs> I can envision a situation where we have no social security or limited social security, no Medicare, no Medicaid, no unemployment benefits, no welfare system, and 50% plus unemployment. That's what I think a collapse is. And you know, we're in a we're in a country that assumes somebody's gonna take care of us, right? Yeah. If I if I get in trouble, I may not be well taken care of, but at least I know I can be taken care of. 
not when there's no resources. And yeah. so, I, I, you know, maybe that does sound gloom and boom doom, but it's reality is that I truly believe we're in a, not, not by design, but we're in a giant Ponzi scheme mm -hmm. that comes to an end. And we know what happens when they come to an end, they just disintegrate. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it, it, I, I agree with you. <laughs> I think we're in a giant Ponzi scheme. I mean, I'm an accountant by trade. And I look at things like balance sheets and, and the, and the numbers and the debt. And, you know, when you look at, just look at, I love to look at John Exter's pyramid, the extra pyramid and, you know, the, all the derivatives, all the debt, just uh, all this, everybody owes. I mean, and you mentioned it earlier, you know, the, on a worldwide basis, we have more than $300 trillion in debt. And, um, and, and then if I'm correct, the whole entire world GDP on an annual basis is about a hundred trillion. Uh, so like we're at three times, which that I thought I always had heard that once you go above like 120% uh, debt to GDP ratio, that you're in big trouble. So how can the world not be in big trouble right now? I feel like the biggest advantage I have over so many of the forecasters out there is that I was I was an institutional money manager back in the early eighties, late seventies, early eighties. Yeah, I came into this in seventy three. So, so I know what high inflation does, and it changes the equation dramatically. We thought we had high inflation for the brief moment we were at nine percent, and we think you know the numbers we're seeing now are too high, et cetera. It's a whole different ball game when this thing goes into you know high yeah. hyperinflation. Yeah. It changes a lot of your what what you have to access and what you know what's available to you as a policy maker, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And it just it it stops the clock. I yeah. mean, as a as a, a consumer, even right. I mean, yep. uh, uh, you, I mean, we're aren't, we're kind of seeing that right now, like people that go to buy cars, like they were used to this zero interest rate environment. And if you're an average person, now you go to buy a car and like, well, yeah, we can give you a loan, but it's at 9% or 10% if you're average credit worthiness, like it slows things. It really does slow things down. But, but the, the real place where it really changes things is above a certain amount that we saw a little bit of it in 2022 and three, but mm -hmm. above a certain amount uh, of inflation, you lose that printing press. Uh -huh. We we only have seen this country look like standard of living hasn't changed much and everybody's, you know, most people are doing okay, if not doing well. Most as because we've been able to monetize the debt, you know, yeah. for the last for last many decades, most of our growth is coming out of government growth. It's not private sector growth. You know, look mm -hmm. what's happened to the auto industry. Look what's happened to the steel industry. Look what's happened to many of our industries that went overseas. If we had no printing press and no monetization of the debt, we would have realized that long ago that our country's in decline. But yeah. they've pumped it up through the massive expansion of government. Yeah. The problem is that's even that's going to come to an end because you're going to lose the printing press. So this, you know, the thing I, I laugh at is MMT, you know, modern monetary theory that the Democrats seem to think works, that you can just out infinitum print money. You can you can expand government for as long as you want because there's always more money to print. You know, we can monetize it. Yeah. Not when inflation breaks out. All of a sudden then you can't. Once once the government finds out they have limitations, that there's nowhere to go when you have a Let's let's just look at a um, you know a natural emergency and have a hurricane, hurricane or something where they declare a, a state of emergency. Where'd that money come from? It didn't come out of thin air. They monetized debt. They they took it out of you know they said okay well we we can always you know sell more treasuries and get more money. Once that once we lose access to the capital markets as a government and that's coming, mm -hmm. um, all of a sudden you have to live within your means. So, so yeah, why is that? In our lifetimes, we haven't lived within our means. No, right, right. And I, and I have a question for you. How does that happen? It, like, what what triggers this situation where the government can no longer? You said because of inflation. Is that because if they if they try to monetize, it just creates a, a doom cycle or a well, a well, basically, right now we're talking about to service our debt is a trillion dollars in our budget, right? Right which is better, bigger than you know, our military budget. Mm -hmm. 
if if interest rates double from here and and um the amount of debt they issue in the bust uh causes that to almost double right. you know you're talking about probably four or five trillion in servicing debt i don't know what our whole budget is but it's less than that yeah. i mean far less than that they're just not going to have the money now initially coming out of the bust rates will move up gradually initially not for very long but you know initially it'll be gradual you'll see them floating more debt to get money to service the debt mm -hmm. you and i know you as an accountant know that doesn't last very long um and and soon they're going to run out of that option once yeah. again it's once they lose you know once once the the world and the fed unless it well, the fed's the buyer of last resort the reason i know i can call i'm calling for a zero percent 10 year at the bottom of the bust mm -hmm. People go, well, China's selling our debt. Nobody else, you know, why do you think it can go to, I go, the Fed's going to be printing 20 trillion. That means 20 trillion of appetite for debt, for mm -hmm. U.S. debt. So um, once the printing press stops, they aren't there to, to be the buyer of last resort of debt. Nobody else in the world is going to want it. They're going to look at our balance sheet and say, no, you're not a good risk anymore. You're not double A. You're not single A, you know. Yeah. Looking out, you're you're. We don't want your debt, yeah. uh, or we want it at an extraordinary high price, higher you know, rate, high interest rate. Yeah, it just the math doesn't work. I can't even pretend to know how that equation gets balanced. It just if if I'm anywhere nigh right, near right, mm -hmm. on my uh, scenario, you know, before the end of this decade, we're we're going to be really questioning how do we service our debt. Uh, David, I could speak to you for uh, probably another hour, but I, I think we've gone almost an hour already. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I will put your your information at the beginning of the video on the bottom of the screen, but I, I, I didn't give you uh, the opportunity to really tell us about yourself. I do know your, your title, Chief Macro Strategist at the Contrarian Macro Advisors. What else would you like to share with our audience about you and how they might learn more about you or learn about your work? Sure. Um, yeah, most of the time I'm on Twitter. That's basically where you could access me today. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, my my formal jobs are done. I'm still, you know, I call it semi-retirement, but I work as hard as ever in terms of this stuff. But I'm on Twitter most of the time, um, okay. answering questions, replying to people's yeah. comments. Um, so if they go to at Dave H Contrarian, um, they'll find me there. Okay. Uh, and I also put out a quarterly newsletter. Okay. Um, that is called the Contrarian Macro or the Contrarian uh, uh, was Contrarian Value Advisor. Okay. Um, and that's a quarterly letter that I put out by subscription. So there's a cost to it. If people okay. are interested in that, just go to Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, and uh, use a direct message there. There's the little you know, icon that shows an envelope. Direct message me and I will provide details to the letter. Okay, okay. So that's the primary way they can learn about the letter. There's not a website they should go to. Yeah, I don't have a website. Okay. So I pretty much do everything through Twitter. So I will put your uh, a link to your Twitter, um, or X, I'm sorry, uh, account at the top of the description to this video. Um, and then I'll also have it on the screen for people to see as well. Again, on behalf of myself and our viewer, this has been a fascinating conversation. Um, I really appreciate you joining your, or uh, joining me and giving your insights into what you see going on, because what you say makes sense to me. Um, and I learned a lot today. So thank you, David. And hopefully we'll get you back here in the basement again sometime in the future. Sure. Sounds good. I always like basements. <laughs> <laughs> well, the basement door is always open for you, David. <laughs> well, thanks for having me on, Ron. Okay. You're welcome. We'll talk to you soon. Okay.